Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Marav Fine at the Jewish Funders Network in New York. Um, we're here today joined by Becca Heller and the International Refugee Assistance Project and Janice Resnick of the Jewish World Watch, along with Kate Norland from the International Refugee Assistance Project and also uh, our guest Ahmed or Srash. Um, we at the Jewish Funders Network are really committed to bringing funders together to learn as much as we can about issues and that are, in, that are <clears throat> excuse me, of high priority to us and expanding the way that we understand funding um, in the Jewish community and beyond. Our mission is to leverage the power and creativity of networks to affect change in the Jewish world, and every program that we do here at JFN is connected to one of our core values. Um, this particular program, I think, is connected to so many of them, but in most uh, importantly, I think, relates to Tikkun Olam, repairing the world, coming together to understand more about how we can um, affect change together, how we can create a better world together. Um, first, we're going to hear from Janice Resnick, a founder of Jewish World Watch and a JFN member, um, and then Becca Heller, then uh, Srash, and then Kate, and then Becca again, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. Um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to type them into the web chat, or you can email them to me. I'll keep an eye on my email as well. Um, and without further ado, uh, Janice, you can take it away. Thanks. Great. So good morning. Um, let's go to the the historical background. The Jewish World Watch is an organization which Rabbi Harold Scholweis of blessed memory and I started in response to the Darfur genocide in 2004. And we began this organization really out of a sense of the silence that was so prevailing during the Rwandan genocide. When, when, when the next genocide began, Rabbi Schulweiss and I said, well, we can't let another genocide ensue without making um, a lot of noise about it and trying to impact policy uh, and do something to help. Uh, so we organized ma mainly around synagogues and um, our mission that we established, I'm, I'm having a hard time to get it there. Our mission that we establish is to ensure that never again will there be silence in the face of genocide and mass atrocity. And uh, our focus was to organize around uh, synagogues, schools, churches, and then the community at large, uh, and to use education, advocacy, and stra strategies to try to mobilize people and to impact policy in Washington, D.C., and then to provide direct assistance to survivors of genocide. When the, um, our, our main focus for many, many years has been and continues to be the genocide in Darfur, which continues. There's still hundreds of thousands of displaced people who are homeless and are in refugee camps in various places, and we continue to advocate in their behalf and provide assistance. Uh, we then moved into a couple of other areas in the world um, where we felt the atrocities were just so outrageous, most notably in Congo where uh, we felt that it was not a genocide, but there was a femicide of sorts going on with the rape of thousands of women on a weekly basis. Um, so we began to mobilize mostly around rape prevention and rape recovery in Congo. Uh, the, the issue particularly relevant to this seminar relates to the struggle that we had as an organization when uh, the Syrian refugee crisis became um, so prevailing that um, it, it felt like it was not really on all fours with our with our mission, but it was so outrageous and so um, just such a, a horror that we needed to figure out a way that our organization could engage on on this issue. The reason it was such a struggle was because the conflict in Syria uh, is not one that we were very knowledgeable about, and it was not clear that it was a genocide. It was an atrocity, of course, but we had avoided situations where we could not figure out um, if there was an ethnic, if there was an ethnic um, slant to to the travesties that were happening. And in this, in that case, we just didn't know enough, and no one was able to. Uh, tell us that there was a genocide or an ethnically based or um, racially based 
bent to what was going on in Syria. There was with certain populations, um, but not in general. So we really struggled as an organization um, as to what we, what we could do and what we should do without letting our mission um, creep into areas that were beyond our expertise or capacity. We ultimately decided, and you can see here when, we, when you juxtapose um, Jewish um, refugees from the Second World War uh, in, some of this, in some of these photos and the slides with the Syrian refugees, that it was, set, it was such a compelling and related tragedy that we could not maintain credibility without doing something about this, and we could not really, as a matter of conscience, call ourselves an organization that was concerned with crises in the world without engaging. So we did engage mostly on an advocacy basis in coalition with other organizations and educate we did educational work we did advocacy work uh, we worked with the obama administration to increase the number of syrian refugees that would be taken into the united states we continue to work uh, on the executive orders and of, of course oppose those orders in many different respects including the number of refugees um, from syria that would be admitted to the united states and we are providing uh, direct assistance through um, Israel and through the joint so far um, in, for the refugees that are in Greece. So while this is not really 100% um, within the original mission of Jewish World Watch, we decided that we would bend our mission and uh, engage um, on the issue of Syrian refugees, and we continue to do that. Um, to the extent that we can. There are organizations that are, are specifically, and some are on this call today, specifically organized just to deal with that issue. So we like to be supportive to them, working in partnership and funding in partnership. In the other cases of our organization, we fund directly. We help develop projects and programs, which we then implement with local partners. But with respect to this, the plight of the Syrian refugees, because it is sort of a little off mission for us. We don't create our own programs. We are looking for projects that are credible and reliable that we can fund other organizations for whom this is their main focus. Um, so I, I, I think that gives you enough of an overview of what Jewish World Watch is and maybe what we aren't and how we struggle to be able to uh, not be silent in the face of tragedies and horrors in the world, but also not um, not completely abandon our mission. There was a lot of pressure on us to leave some of our other areas that we work in and to put more emphasis on the situation of the Syrian refugees, which we decided not to do uh, because there are other organizations doing that. But uh, And we also believe strongly in not abandoning people or projects that we have begun many years ago that we continue to work on. Uh, I feel this way, by the way, strongly. I'm a funder and a philanthropist and do funding of uh, Jewish World Watch, mainly because of all the reasons, the passion I have for, um, for the cause, and um, will continue to work on, on these issues. I think that, that probably sums it all up for now. Terrific. Um, Becca, you want to uh, take it away? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thanks to everyone for joining, and um, thank you so much to the Jewish Funders Network for organizing and um, to Jewish World Watch for the great work that you do. Um, I'm going to be talking about the work of the International Refugee Assistance Project. Um, there's three of us who will be talking, myself, our Middle East field manager, Kate Norland, and Ahmed Srash, one of our former clients. Um, so I'll try to keep it pretty tight. Um, so, you know, I think that um, a lot of people have been, have been looking at the major numbers of refugees displaced in the world right now, and there are, you know, something like 65 million total displaced people, which is the greatest number since the refugee crisis following World War II. Out of those, an 11 million alone are displaced Syrian refugees. And I think that, that funders and philanthropists and frankly also, you know, nonprofit leaders and lawyers look at this number and they say, oh my goodness, that's so big, I can't possibly, you know, make a meaningful dent in that. Um, so I want to talk about sort of the way that we're trying to approach this, you know, one case at a time um, and through broader systemic advocacy to try to, 
to make a meaningful dent, to say, you know, in the face of such large numbers, like what does it mean? Um, and, and also it's really important to me that whenever we talk about our work, we have a client speak as well because first of all, part of our job as advocates is to empower, you know, refugees and displaced persons, but also I think it's important to remember that like 65 million people isn't just a huge number. Every single one of those people has a name, has a mother, has a story. Um, so I'm really glad that you're going to be able to hear from Sarash today as well. Um, our focus has been on legal solutions to the refugee crisis. I think there's a lot of talk now about livelihood solutions, and that's really important. But it's also important to remember that um, if you don't have the right to work in a particular country, then participating in a livelihoods program might get you deported if you're not properly registered. In fact, legal registration with the United Nations is a prerequisite to all other forms of refugee aid. So that includes like NGOs assisting refugees, it includes being in a camp. Um, but the registration process, in addition to you know, the protection process for people who are having emergencies on the ground such as women at risk, or the resettlement process which is the legal path that refugees take to get to Europe or the U.S. both to reach safety and to avoid smuggling is incredibly convoluted and really difficult to navigate. Um, for example, to come to the U.S. as a resettled refugee, you have to have a minimum of four interviews. They can be anywhere from one to seven hours long. Um, and traditionally, you've been banned from having legal counsel present. Um, in addition to this, of course, refugees have been politicized in a way by, I think, the populist movements in Europe, by the new administration in the United States, that they, they really haven't been since World War II, and that's putting up additional obstacles to resettlement that, that refugees have to navigate. So our job is to you know, cut through the politics, cut through the red tape, find the most vulnerable refugees, and help them find sort of lasting safety and get legal status. Oh, hold on, I tried to move the slide and it didn't work. Okay. Uh, we actually started our organization just as a group of law students in 2008. Um, we were called the Iraqi Refugee Assistance Project. We were like an extracurricular student organization at Yale Law School, um, just trying to help Iraqi refugees because we felt um, that there was you know, a moral imperative for us to deal with the humanitarian fallout of our country's foreign policy. I graduated from law school in 2010, um, took the bar, which I hope never happens to anybody on this call, um, and started doing IREP full time in the fall of 2010. In 2015, we changed our name. We kept the acronym, which was convenient, to the International Refugee Assistance Project um, because we had a huge number of Syrian clients in the Middle East, and we actually have clients from um, 55 different countries of origin. So um, we're using our model to assist people who are all over the world. Um, our model really has two components. The first is direct legal aid to refugees. We leverage what we refer to as a virtual public interest law firm um, to represent thousands of refugees at once. We have chapters. Um, actually, since we created these slides for the presentation, we added another chapter. So we're, we have 30 chapters now at law schools across the U.S. and Canada. Um, they're partnered with pro bono attorneys from over 75 firms to work on cases addressing the sort of long-term legal needs of refugees to get safety. Um, the other nice piece of that is that it both trains um, you know, 2,000 people a year, some of the top law students in the country, some of the top lawyers around the world to be advocates for refugees, and it leverages the resources of law firms. So for every dollar we spend, we're able to turn that into about $10 of legal aid because of the in-kind support that the law firms provide. In addition to our direct legal aid, we engage in broad systemic advocacy. So we basically say, you know, this this system was set up in like 1948. It was approved in 1951. No one's really done much with it since then. It's not in great shape to deal with some of the challenges of today. So for example, with you know, the Syrian conflict, um, you know, it, it's really probably not a genocide because there's not an ethnic element. Similarly, people fleeing Syria, technically under the legal definition, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> I'm done, I always sneeze in twos. Um, might not be considered refugees because the definition doesn't apply to general conflict. So how can our systems and laws and institutions you know, evolve to meet today's needs? So we try to use the lessons that we learn from our direct legal aid to push for broader systemic change, utilizing legislation and litigation and administrative advocacy strategies as a force multiplier. 
So through all that work to date, um, we've provided legal counsel to nearly 20,000 refugees. We've successfully helped resettle 3,200 refugees to safety in 15 different destination countries. Um, and we actually got uh, another piece of legislation um, into the continuing resolution, which is the version of the budget that the U.S. is going to pass. So as soon as that's voted on this week, um, we'll have benefited uh, 152,600 refugees through policy changes. Um, so that's sort of a, a bit of an overview of what IRAP does. Um, I'm really excited that you're going to be able to hear directly from Ahmed Sarash, or Sarash as I know him. Um, he was a former IRAP client um, who served alongside U.S. forces in Afghanistan. When he applied for a special immigrant visa to the United States, um, he was stuck in this crazy bureaucratic complex process for years. Um, we were introduced to him through the producer of a documentary for Vice about the special immigrant visa process, and Srash was one of the few people who was brave enough to um, not only share his story in the documentary, but also let them use his real face in a way that I think was um, risky for him, but incredibly important in terms of kind of humanizing um, the stories behind these bureaucratic processes. So um, Srash, I'm really happy that you can join us today to share your story and uh, how you worked with IRAP. Thank you very much for invite, inviting me in this meeting. I'm glad to uh, talk to you. And uh, thank you for everyone which is uh, hearing my uh, voice. Um, I al I always thankful from IRAP. Uh, without IRAP, I I can't do nothing. I, I stuck in the middle of nowhere in Afghanistan, which uh, I I don't have access to the internet. So like uh, that was IRAP that helped me. Like they really helped me a lot to do my process with the SIV. So. Uh, they they got me the visa for me. They 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 provide me the um, attorney which get contact with the U.S. Embassy back in Afghanistan. And um, IRAP is the only organization which really helped the Afghan interpreters that used to work with Americans, and they had a chance to come to the United States. Still, IRAP is working with them. Uh, are working so hard for those people which is still in Afghanistan and this is the only chance that uh, people have to get here and those people which uh, work uh, alongside with the United States military as a linguist so um, that's why I, I, I get contact with the IRAP and I always want to share my uh, stories about how I get there and my experience with the IRAP was amazing. And without IRAPs, I couldn't make any change to get here, you know. Like, uh, I'm glad that I'm here, and thank you very much again from IRAP. And about the SIV, SIV process is kind of like a little bit complicated. And people over there, they, they, they don't know how to deal with the paperwork because uh, just a lawyer can do that uh, to apply for a visa for the United States. It's not easy. The people over there, uh, they don't have access to the Internet. They don't have access to the computers to do the paperwork. The only way which they can do to get contact with the phone or something like find Internet around their area to get contact with the IRAPs and try to get help. And I'm glad that IRAP uh, IRAP organization helping them out. And today I already talked one of the um, clients of IRAP called Nabil, and he asked me about the new uh, about the uh, um, SIV process. Uh, and they, I think, the government already issued some visas for them. And I told them like, please get contact and stay in touch with the IRAP. Um, uh, people and they're going to help me uh, help you out with your visa and process. And that was my story, and I'm now here. I'm so happy from uh, IRAP, which did against me. And um, finally, I got to the United States. I'm working so hard. I'm happy. I, I live in very peaceful uh, area and community, working and going some colleges, some schools. Uh, try to learn some more about this country, and I'm so happy and really thankful for my raps.
That's it. Thanks so much, Trash. It was uh it was an honor to work with you. Um, and people, anyone who wants to see um, Srash kind of in Afghanistan um, as he fought to deal with this process, there's a really incredible 32-minute documentary that Vice did called The Interpreters um, that you can watch online for free. Uh, yeah. I don't have a link offhand, but we can provide one afterwards. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to talk about, you know, is is our response to the travel ban. So. Um, you know, the, the President was inaugurated on Friday, January 20th. Um, nobody really knew which of the many fun things he had promised to do that he was going to get into first. And then by the following Monday, it became really obvious that it was going to be the travel ban. Um, drafts of the executive order started leaking. Um, we called all of our clients who had valid visas, and we said, you know, get on a plane immediately. And then we realized that a ton of people were going to be in the air when the order was signed so that when they took off from Afghanistan or Jordan or Iraq or Malaysia or wherever, they would have status. But by the time they landed in the U.S., they wouldn't have legal status to enter and no one knew what was going to happen to them. So um, we organized a coalition of NGOs around the country, um, including – oh, wait, there we go. Sorry. I thought I lost slide control. Um, including uh, the ACLU, One Justice, Public Counsel, the National Immigration Law Center, and Yale Law School, and over 1,600 individual attorneys um, to go to airports um, and defend the rights of incoming refugees and immigrants. Um, this led to a protest movement that we didn't organize, but I think got a ton of visibility and really helped take control of the narrative over the executive order. As it turned out, um, when people landed at airports, they were detained by Customs and Border Protection. Um, a lot of them were held overnight. They were handcuffed. There were children that were held um, because there was no plan for how to deal with them. So in addition to deploying lawyers at the airports, which is, which is a moment I'm really proud of um, because I think whenever you know, the news media or anyone reports on the first executive order, the, the sentence after it is almost always um, you know, which led to chaos at the airports. And I think we helped to create and shine a light on that chaos. Um, that also led to a lot of litigation. So um, within 27 hours of the first executive order, we had won an emergency temporary restraining order saying that no refugees or immigrants could be deported or detained. Um, as the order came down at about 8.30 p.m. on Saturday night, and then thousands of people were released from airports all over the country. Um, we're also the lead plaintiff in a broader lawsuit called IRAP v. Trump, which is the first lawsuit that challenges the entirety of the executive order as unconstitutional. Um, there's also, thanks to this movement, I think something like 24 active lawsuits around the country challenging the executive order. Um, and we're actually going to be heard on appeal um, in the Fourth Circuit this coming Monday, and it's going to be broadcast live. So anyone who's um, a really nerdy lawyer and wants to watch will be able to do that. Um, but the Fourth Circuit has deemed that this case is so important that usually it would only be heard by three judges who are randomly selected. But in this case, it's going to be heard by all 15 judges on the Fourth Circuit, um, which is something that hasn't happened since uh, roughly the 1960s. Um, so we're continuing to try to utilize um, the momentum that we gained responding that first weekend to sort of a broader litigation strategy. Um, and I'll talk more about kind of how, how funders can invest in litigation to help refugees and why I think now is a particularly important time to do that. Um, but first, um, Kate Norland, IRAP's Middle East Field Manager, will be um, talking about the impact of the travel ban on refugees overseas. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm based in Beirut. Uh, we have offices in Lebanon and in Jordan. We're, we're seven in Lebanon and six in Jordan. And basically what we're doing is trying to identify the refugees who are in the most danger over here uh, so that they can be resettled. You saw that huge number of 65 million. Obviously not all of those are people are going to get resettled, it's about 1% who get resettled. Uh, and so we're trying to identify who really needs to be resettled. And to do that, we, uh, we reach out to NGOs, especially NGOs that aren't within the UNHCR framework, uh, very small local NGOs who are really in touch with people. 
uh, and we train them on who might qualify for resettlement so that they can keep their eyes open for those kinds of cases and then refer them to us to do the legal work of developing a case that we can present before the UNHCR. And then in turn, they tell us about the services they provide so that we can refer refugees to those services and get people connected with education, health care, housing, whatever their immediate needs are while we're working on their resettlement case. Uh, and as Becca said, the executive order was really devastating for many of our refugee clients here and for many refugees, uh, our clients and beyond. First of all, there were the refugees who were immediately affected, who were in the U.S. pipeline. Um, some people had already had their USCIS interview, had been given a preliminary acceptance. We had one case of a transgender woman from Iraq, a lawyer, uh, who had been given a certificate showing that she had completed her cultural orientation sessions and that, you know, pending security checks, she would be able to travel in the next couple of months. Uh, and all of a sudden, her case was completely put on hold, and we had to go back to UNHCR and request that because of the extreme urgency of her situation as a transgender woman, she be referred to a European country instead of having to wait to see what would happen with the U.S. Um, there were other refugees who had been expecting a USCIS interview within the next couple of weeks. Uh, we had one case of a, a Syrian couple, a husband and wife journalist team, uh, who had been activists against the Assad regime. And as you know, Hezbollah is very powerful in Lebanon and is a very strong ally of the Assad regime and is, is threatening them here. And so they were desperate to get out. They had an interview scheduled for the first week of February. And as soon as the executive order came down, it was canceled. Uh, and their case was again put on hold. And now they're put in this horrible position of having to decide, OK, do we wait uh, and see what happens and try to get to the U.S. Uh, where one of their mother is living? Or do we try to get to another country, which might be faster uh, so that we can reach safety sooner? Uh, and then in addition to these cases of people who were immediately directly affected, there are a lot of refugees who would normally at least be considered by UNHCR for resettlement and quite possibly qualify and be referred for resettlement, but now will not have that opportunity because the United States drastically cut down on the number of refugees that we intend to admit. Uh, so. That number went down to 50,000, which is lower than it's been in, in many, many years. And that means that a lot of refugees who would otherwise have been considered, now UNHCR still considers them qualified, but just has nowhere to send them. Uh, so they are just going to be stuck waiting in, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in other countries where they're not safe, where they're, uh, I mean, we have cases now that UNHCR is saying, nope, we're not going to call that person for an interview where normally in the past they, they would definitely have called them, uh, including LGBTI cases, medical cases, cases of, of women who are alone and, and facing threats of violence. Uh, so it's a, very, it's a very dangerous situation uh, for a lot of people. And, and one thing that we're trying to do is to find alternative pathways beyond just the UNHCR referral process. Uh, for those cases, like asylum visas, um, direct referrals to embassies, you know, student visas in some cases. Uh, but those are all very small, limited programs, and it, it's, it's not going to replace what, what was lost when the United States uh, drastically reduced those numbers. Thanks so much, Kate. Uh, uh, so I just I want to end kind of with, with two um, slides, one on um, why we should care about refugee resettlement. You know, it's, it's only available to a small number of people compared to the total number of refugees worldwide, um, and then also how funders can assist. I think, you know, when speaking to a Jewish audience, um, you have to do a little bit less convincing of people that refugee resettlement is really important because I think most of us either lost people who weren't able to resettle or are alive because people were able to resettle around World War II. Um, but I also think it's important that as people invested in refugee issues, we be able to speak about the importance of refugee resettlement, not just from a humanitarian perspective, but from a, the perspective of, of global peace and security. I think that refugee resettlement is really critical critical to the national security interests of the U.S. and European countries. Um, 
in part because you know refugees are are fleeing ISIS. These are the people that ISIS is persecuting, and if we're serious about trying to fight back against uh, Islamic State-sponsored terrorism, then we need to be doing something about the people who are getting hurt by that. Further, you know, Kate's based in Lebanon. IREP also has an office in Jordan. The, the places that are hosting the most refugees in the world right now tend to be Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, um, countries that don't have strong infrastructure to begin with, have taken in millions of Syrian refugees and also who we need to be our allies and um, are, are coming to us and saying, you know, we can't continue to sort of bear the entire brunt of the Syrian refugee crisis. We need to see that the U.S. is playing a role in the Middle East beyond just dropping Tomahawk missiles when there's a chemical attack. We need to be sort of projecting a humanitarian role as well. Um, and finally, I think that, it's, you know, as long as we think of refugees as the other um, and ignore our kind of prerogative to to embrace the stranger. Um, it allows xenophobia and Islamophobia to continue. I think that refugee resettlement has been politicized, as I mentioned, in recent years to a degree that's, that's really new since World War II, and that if we stop admitting refugees into this country and turn our backs on them, that that's allowing the only narrative to spread to be one of fear um, and, and one of otherization. Um, finally, a couple thoughts on how funders can help. The first is um, we, you know, in the past administration, a lot of our focus around advocacy was on administrative advocacy, um, talking to, you know, folks in the State Department and in Homeland Security about how to do better. I think that's not really an option anymore. Um, I think on the flip side, you have courts in the U.S. you have a judicial system that is uniquely willing um, to try to be a check on xenophobic or tyrannical policies coming from the executive branch. So I think this is a really good time to litigate a number of issues that before courts wouldn't have really wanted to touch, but right now they're, they're willing to take on. The second is um, to support advocacy efforts in the U.S. to push for um, highly vulnerable refugees to continue to be resettled here. No one really knows what the refugee resettlement number is going to be set at um, for next year, but it seems like it might be as low as 50,000, which would be less than half of the number that we committed to taking in this year. Um, third, um, we've had a lot of folks ask us, you know, how can I sponsor a refugee? And while Canada has um, a private sponsorship system, the U.S. really doesn't. So um, you can reach out. Every community where refugees resettle has a local resettlement agency in charge of resettling refugees. And you can ask, you know, as a private citizen or as a funder, um, how can I participate in some kind of sponsorship model to assist refugees after they arrive? Um, and finally, you can support advocacy efforts with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to bolster capacity um, and in investing in NGOs to, to add on to the capacity that the UN has. I think we're going to see the UN get its funding cut pretty significantly, especially by the US. We've already seen them downsizing their offices really seriously on the ground in countries with large Syrian refugee populations. And I think civil society is going to need to step up and to provide some of the referral services, the protection services that traditionally would be coming from the UN. Um, so I think funding to frontline NGOs to, to kind of supplant the role of UNHCR would also be really important. Um, that is, you know, everything we can think of to tell you about refugees in a 34-minute nutshell. Um, thanks so much to everyone for listening, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Marav now. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that. Um, the work that you are doing both at IRAP and at the Jewish World Watch is incredible and invaluable. Um, and I'm so grateful to know that you're out there doing it, and I know that our members are too. Um, everyone's been unmuted, so if you have any questions that you'd like direct at any of our speakers. We have lots of time. Um, let us know. Looking to see if there are any questions. Here's one. Um, from a funder's perspective, what, or, or from, I see, from a funder's perspective, um, or from a nonprofit perspective for funders, 
what um, what are some concrete things that um, funders can be doing to engage in this work that will be impactful? Um, well, I, you know, I think I would I would go back to um, the slide that's still up. I think th those are sort of the four concrete things that that we suggest. So just to to sort of sum them up, you know, one, I think we should be supporting more lawsuits around this issue. I think we should be supporting litigation in the U.S. as well as in Europe about the rights of refugees and about, um, you know, disparate treatment for immigrants from different countries or different religious backgrounds. Um, the second is, you know, groups like Refugee Council USA, of which IREP is a member, a number of other groups like Human Rights First, the International Rescue Committee, um, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, all are doing advocacy to try to keep the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program alive. Um, the administration is trying to slash that program by over half, so I think funding to some of those organizations to do U.S.-based advocacy is really important. Um, I think if for funders who want to do something more local, um, figuring out who your local resettlement agency is, which you can do online and calling them to see what kind of support they need um, to assist refugees resettled in your area. It may be that they need volunteers. It may be that they need extra caseworkers. But those government funds are also really being slashed, and there's a huge role for funders to step in and play there. Um, and finally, um, in supporting the work of you know, frontline NGOs in the field. And there I would recommend focusing on kind of smaller NGOs. Um, I think a, a, lot of the, a lot of the really fantastic work is being done by small NGOs that might not have the profile of some of the bigger NGOs, but who are getting to a lot of the most vulnerable and hard to reach populations. Um, and if you're interested in a particular country or particular issue um, where IREP has a presence, we'd be happy to provide you with a list of, of organizations that we think are doing really good work there. Uh, uh, this is Janice. Uh, I think there are, there are lots of different levels of getting involved in the refugee um, crisis. And one of the ways that we do it at Jewish World Watch is by vetting the organizations that are working on the ground dealing with um, the, the, trauma, the, the traumatized individuals as they come ashore. And we have chosen um, to work on psychosocial uh, programming, dealing with loss. It's the same kind of work that we did actually with HIAS in the Darfuri refugee camps when you have people uh, arriving very desperate, completely impoverished because they had to leave everything behind, not knowing even what country they're in and where they are and where they're going. They need a lot of uh, different kinds of support, and I think sometimes the psychosocial aspects of support is seen more as a luxury, but uh, according to our conversations with on-the-ground uh, partners, it's not a luxury. It's life-saving uh, and critical kind of work. So we're doing um, – that's what I had mentioned in Lesbos. We're doing work with um, Israel that I think has an outstanding on-the-ground program, and we like um, working with Israeli partners. Another thing to keep in mind through this whole conversation is the the refugees that have been victims of uh, or survivors of traumas from years ago uh, are also suffering as a result of this huge increase in um, refugees in the world. For example, in the Darfur refugee camps, um, there used to be certain allocations, certain calorie allocations by the World Food Program. Those have all been slashed dramatically to accommodate uh, larger, increased numbers of refugees. So while we help the new refugees, we have to also uh, balance um, the new trauma confronting longtime refugees that still have not found um, resettlement opportunities that are trapped in, in refugee camps that are very difficult to serve. Uh, and I think that's a really important factor to keep in mind. Oftentimes the aid that these big, huge international organizations give are in the nature of handouts, which are uh, fine for the very early stages of being a refugee, but they're not really helpful in terms of helping refugees adapt on a long-term basis to a new and often hostile society. So that's one of the, um, the balancing uh, exercises that is really important not to forget um, who we're leaving behind as we serve um, the sort of front page refugees uh, that are um, new new in their status as refugees. Thank you, Jenna. 
Dennis and Rebecca. Do we have any other questions? Question to Becca. What do you think are IRAP's main challenges for the coming year in working vis-a-vis -vis the Trump administration? Uh, I would say that our main challenge is the Trump administration and working vis-a-vis -vis the Trump administration. Um, no, I think a lot of it is just sort of, it's been interesting for us, and we've been talking a lot about this internally, of doing this pivot from, um, you know, working with an administration where we didn't always think they did things in the most, like, fair or often just in the most efficient manner, um, but where, like, we basically agreed with them that the U.S. should try to take in refugees, and we're trying to sort of advocate with them to do that uh, better to this sort of like existential crisis where, where we're fighting for the very existence of the U.S. refugee program. It's been a big pivot for us. Um, it's one that I feel like uh, is going pretty well. We've so far blocked like every aspect of this, both on an individual basis and, um, you know, across the whole country. Um, I do think that the president has an enormous amount of power um, granted to him or uh, maybe someday her um, around immigration issues. So um, some of the legal challenges will, will die out a bit with the end of the fiscal year, and we'll have to continue to look for like new ways to challenge these policies. Um, but I, I view our role right now really as trying to make it as difficult as possible to gut the refugee program in the U.S. to demonstrate why the refugee program is so important, um, and to try to kind of mitigate the, the damage of like hate crimes and, and xenophobia as much as possible um, while focusing on helping our individual clients maybe get to alternative countries like Europe or Canada. Thank you, Becca. Anyone else? So we can wrap thank you. This. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Janice and Becca and Kate and Strash um, and thank Sarah, you. who is on the line but helped organize all of this. Um, it's great to learn with all of you. If you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me um, or to Becca um, or Janice or Kate. I'm sure they're all happy to receive your questions and emails and uh, continue to be in touch on this really important topic. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.